It's a pleasure to have you here. The details now. Ghana has begun preparations to administer the second doses of COVID-19 vaccines to persons who took their first AstraZeneca jabs in March. The country took delivery of 350,000 doses of the vaccines earlier today. Head of our health desk, Fred Smith, was at the Kutuka International Airport when officials from the Ministry of Health, UNICEF and the FDA took delivery of the consignment. Just behind me, you can see the Turkish airline, uh, which brought in the vaccines, 350,000 of them. Uh, the offloading just finished, and uh, I take you here. Uh, the uh, vaccines are being loaded onto these uh, vans to be sent to the Ghana Health Service uh, storage facilities at Kolebu, and then the redistribution will begin. It is 350,000 out of about 850,000 that inoculations that we've done for the first round of vaccinations. Ghana need to give everybody who did the first round of vaccinations a second job. That has also delayed. And so there will be a difference of 500,000 doses uh, to be given. Uh, we've not been told yet how the 500,000 will be procured. But as hope amid uncertainty, as 350,000 vaccines are offloaded from the Turkish aircraft at the Kutuka International Airport. The Agana's share of some 1.3 million doses originally sent to the Democratic Republic of Congo but had to be reallocated to Ghana and five other African countries under the COVAX platform. Those vaccines will have to be used before they expire on June 24. Chief Director at the Health Ministry, Kwabna Pwedu Okwafari, received the consignment on behalf of the Health Minister. Uh, those are 350,000 of AstraZeneca um, vaccines, which um, the origin is from the Democratic Republic of Congo. But as part of the COVAX vaccines that were distributed to African countries, um, we've taken delivery of those so we can start with the um, second dose uh, of vaccination for those who started. And uh, we are still hoping that very soon we'll be able to get more, for, especially for those who are um, going to uh, do the second vaccination. Nearly 850,000 persons have so far received their first jabs of AstraZeneca vaccines in Ghana and were scheduled to receive their second doses after eight weeks. But challenges with the procurement systems have forced health officials to extend this by another four weeks. Health Minister Kwekwa Menu is the first to admit the challenges. We have faced challenges with vaccine availability and payment structures and things like that. It is a difficult challenge. The vaccines we are expecting to be delivered by COVAX in April and May have delayed because of challenges in India. India has stopped exports and therefore we can't have access to um, AstraZeneca any longer. As officials prepare to start the second round of inoculations, it is still unclear which of the 850,000 persons who took the first jobs will get to take the second. Kwabna Pwedu Okuaferi is hopeful the country can bring in more AstraZeneca doses to cover all those who've taken their first jobs. We are still trying to procure more. The issue is that now you know the supply condition in the world has changed. The vaccine market has become very tight. India, that is actually producing the Astra, most of the AstraZeneca uh, vaccines, are uh, in a very dire situation, and therefore uh, most of the exports from India have ceased. But we're still hoping that uh, the Covax um, uh, platform will be able to give us some. Uh, some more. We are still engaging with them and we believe that they will be able to give us what we require. Not only COVAX, but we are trying uh, all over. Um, we are in touch with the UK, we are in touch with uh, the manufacturers themselves and we hope that we will be able to get the amount required.
to be able to do the second vaccine. Ghana plans to vaccinate 20 million of its 31 million population by end of the year to achieve herd immunity. It's unclear if this plan is still on course following the difficulties suffered by the procurement systems. Fred Smith, Joy News. Now, the chief of Edumasa at Asante Drabing in the Ashanti region is said to have ordered the demolition of a school building in order to construct his palace. Children in kindergarten returned from midterm with no space to learn, compelling management of the Edumasa RC primary school to suspend classes. Head of the Bridgewood clan of Edumasa, Nana Jeche Amponsa, who led the demolition claims he acted under instructions of the chief. Now the firm Sarasta Sasari Donko visited the school and has filed this report. This structure used to house children in the KG1 and 2. After a rainstorm ripped off the roof, school authorities were compelled to build this temporary structure to house the children. But when school reopened, the structure had been demolished. The room which contains learning materials, had its roof ripped off, destroying some of the items. So two weeks ago, when the Adumasa RC KG1 and 2 were on midterms, the chief of Adumasa, Nana Opong, taxed some men to rip off the roofing of this room, which is the office and holds valuable learning materials for the children. And so the learning materials, books, assessment items, learning test books, valuable to the education of children were exposed to the rains. And some of them, as you can see, have already started deteriorating. So as we speak, this office and its materials in here, exercise books, trunks, other things belonging to the children, remain exposed to the vagaries of the weather. KG1 and 2 children were sent home on Wednesday due to lack of classroom. Some parents are incensed. About a week ago, some men started demolishing a the structure. They claimed it was the directive of the chief. I was very troubled when I heard this because the kids will have nowhere to study. The chief of Edumasa, Nanayao Opon, admits he has plans to use the land to build the palace. He, however, says he did not instruct the demolition of the school structure. This, however, contradicts the stance of the head of the Britio clan of Edumasa, who supervised the demolition. Nana Jeche Amponsa says he was ordered by the Edumasa chief to pull down the structure. The community contributed to build a place for the kids when their numbers increased. Recently, the chief informed me that the roof has been ripped off and he has informed the district assembly who has given him the not to demolish the structure because of developed cracks. So the chief paid the carpenters and only took care of the materials. The stranded children were sent home as management of the school struggles to find temporal space to accommodate them. The foundation of this country, the children who are supposed to take over from us, are the ones who used to occupy this space. But now, due to the elements, there is no roofing for where they will sit and learn until somebody, an institution or government, 
sees the plight of these children as an emergency. School is closed for the KG1, KG2 pupils of the Adumasa RC Primary School. Reporting for Joy News, Erastus Asaridonko, Adumasa Ashanti Region. Now, a middle-aged man who attempted to help retrieve the body of a 10-year-old boy who drowned in the Dafyama Dakala Dam in the Dafyama Busie Isa district met his untimely death when he also got drowned in the same dam. Simon Wille, who hails from Dung in that district, was on his way to Olo. Upon reaching Dafyama, he decided to join a search team to look for the 10-year-old Joseph on Sunday. Uh, Joseph Sunday, who drowned on Tuesday. Now, when the lifeless body of Joseph Sunday was retrieved, Simon could not be found. Rafik Salam reports. Ten year old Joseph Sunday returned from school Tuesday afternoon, changed his school uniform to Mufti, and confided in his father, Sunday Sabawe, that he was joining his colleagues at the Lanchala Dam site to pick she and Nat. Uh, uh. Uh, I did see a guy the name a a a dampo sia. So a tanga can be a a dampo sia. A man lire. There's a sea tree closer to the dam. That is the sea food. So another man there's a guy. I was here when the stepmother came and told me that Joseph went into the dam with a friend and get and he got drunk. Little did he know that those were the last words from his primary three son, whom he described as very respectful and intelligent, and his death has turned his world upside down. I'm feeling bad. I'm not feeling happy. Yeah, I'm not feeling happy. I'm feeling sorry. Joseph Sandy later joined one of his friends to the Danchala Dam, constructed under the One Village One Dam initiative of the government to swim using jaded logs cut from shared trees. What I'm holding on is a branch of a tree and I can tell you that it weighs about 40 kilograms and that's what is used by the pupils uh, to do the swimming. This is a branch of a tree that was cut around. They brought it into the dam and then used as a boat. And so the unfortunate thing happened yesterday at the Fema Danchala. Two boys came into this dam to do swimming. And then they jumped into these branches of the trees that are dotted across the dam. And unfortunately, one got drawn. Assemblyman for the Fema South Electoral Area, TB Solomon, told me how the incident occurred. The, the wood locks that are lying around this area, uh, that is what they use in swimming. Uh, uh, they use them as their boat in swimming. Uh, they, they get pleasure in it. And unfortunately, the, the sad incident happened. Personnel from the Dafima will say it's a district DBI National Disaster Management Organization, NADMU, were called to the scene to help retrieve the body. And for several hours, they were not making any headway. They sought for local support and local divers from Chari before they could step foot on the dam. A middle-aged man, Simon Willie, who hailed from Doom, was passing to the Olo community and head of the unfortunate incident. David Kumbini is the Dafima Bure Isa District Director of NADMU. Unfortunately, today he couldn't also make it. So the same day we continued the search and the rescue, we couldn't because it was beyond us. We equally had to reach out to the experts again to come. In fact, I wish you were here early to see the wonders of God. Our local people have something good for us. The incident, according to the Dafima Bure, is a district board director of a stretch his personnel to their elastic limit and therefore called for the need to have a well equipped search and rescue team. Not just a team by name, team that are specialized and skillful. That we don't pray, but uh, when the unfortunate happened, at least we will run after them for their assistance. Yesterday, for instance, I made calls all over the region and other areas, thinking we could get people, but at the distance, it wasn't that possible. But we we're lucky our brothers from Chari actually was able to save us from that. 
wonderful situation. The lifeless body of 10-year-old Joseph Sandy was retrieved late Wednesday and has since been buried at his native Dafiema. Whilst that of Simon Willey had been moved to Dung for burial. DBI District Chief Executive Nadimoro Sanda, who visited the scene of the incident and the family of Joseph Sandy, is downhearted. He hinted of measures that the assembly would put in place to hold future occurrences. Let me first of all say my condolences to the brief family. And as I said, we've just retrieved the bodies. We're going to sit down as a people and plan and take measures such that such incidents will not happen again. Especially, we will talk to the GES to make sure that students who go to school around this enclave return to their parents and their parents should also take keen interest in taking care of their children. I'm currently at the Fiamma Tendamba DA Primary School and I'm with class three pupils of the school. Under normal circumstances, this is supposed to be the class of Joseph Sunday, but the unfortunate thing happened. His friends, his close allies are telling me what transpired. The games they used to play together and they will surely miss him. Reporting for Joy News, Rafik Salam, Dafima Danchala. Now, the Ghana Police Service on Thursday secured a restraining order from a high court to bar some agitated youth from embarking on a planned protest this Sunday. This was after national security officers met the conveners of the Fix the Country movement to dialogue over concerns which were built up during the social media opera. The order granted by Justice Ruby Aite prevents the group from taking such action on the said day or any other date until the restriction on public gathering is lifted. While well, the Economic Fighters League has noted, it will seek redress to set aside the restraining order from the High Court. A member of that organization, Hadi Yakubu, joins us via Zoom to explain their next move. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Now, have you begun any legal processes yet? Hello, Hardy. If you can unmute, uh, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Right. So, yeah, good afternoon. And good afternoon to all our viewers. Um, I just want to correct that it is, not, it is not just the Economic Fighters League going to court. It is the whole Fix the Country um, Coalition, if you like to call it. It's mm. not really... Uh, one organization. It's, a, it's a, an amalgamation of so many organizations and people across the country. And to answer your question... Well, if you have begun uh, any legal processes yet? Yes. Um, our, our lawyers are working very hard around the clock to make sure that they file the case at the Supreme Court today uh, to seek um, the relief of the court to set aside that injunction. Uh, which we believe is a very, uh, a very strange injunction indeed, an injunction that prescribes uh, citizens of the country from holding a protest on a particular day and even in perpetuity. It absolutely doesn't make sense. Mm. And I don't think it is constitutional for any court to assume the authority to perpetually bar citizens of the country from exercising their political uh, or social or whatever rights mm. that are guaranteed under the constitution. Mm. So while some members of the group were in a meeting with security officers yesterday, this injunction was being secured. How did that make you feel after stepping out of that meeting to later realize that this was actually going on behind the scenes? Well, clearly it was a, a bad faith move, as I said yesterday. Um, I think the, the purpose of the meeting was to get us to back down mm. on our uh, protest and demands. And when that did not work, they then resorted to the court. Um, of course, I mean, we, we, we've always known that uh, leaders in this country are, you know, not comfortable with being asked to account for 
the uh, mantle that has been given to them. And therefore, they will always seek several mm. ways to make sure that they suppress whatever they sent them. All right. We, we quickly so we have were to... not surprised, mm. Mm. but it was a very bad faith move. All right. Uh, we, we, we quickly have to wrap to up on this. Side. Today is Friday. You're hoping to do this on Sunday. Uh, what happens if you're not able to go through the legal process? Are you going to risk being arrested or jailed over this protest? Well, I said yesterday that we respect the injunction. Uh, as law-abiding citizens, we will not uh, disobey the court. All right. But the court is also not going to prevent us from voicing out our displeasure. So we have other other means of protest that we are going to do on Sunday. Mm. It may not necessarily be a physical protest. All right. It will be a protest all the same. All right. I appreciate your time. I appreciate your time this afternoon. Hadi Yakubu is with the Economic uh, Fighters League. Well. Lawyer Samson Ladia Yenene has described that ex-party injunction granted, granted by the High Court Judge Justice Ruby Ayete as strange. On this particular injunction, there is everything strange about the length of the subsistence of the prohibition as granted by the court. With the greatest of respect uh, to the, the court, there is a problem. Uh, on public lending, are listed. Look. The, the law passed by parliament, very lousy legislation passed by them, which empowers the president to issue restrictions. It's not pandemic specific. All over the, the world, they have passed pandemic specific legislation, which, which legislation die as long as the pandemic dies. This one, we have passed it as a substantive law. So it is pandemic neutral, and anybody can use it for eternity. So if you say until it is over, it means that what you are giving could actually be in perpetuity. And that is where I think that if they went back to the court, they will get the court to vacate this order, because this order does not comply with the sound principles of law as even enunciated by the Supreme Court. According to the Supreme Court, you can't grant an ex parte injunction and make the order appear as if there is no limit to the order. So this is bizarre. This is strange. And it ought not happen All right. the exercise of the democratic right. So the phones now, we speak to Dr. Amacha Boating, a political science lecturer at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. Good afternoon, Doc. Thank you for your time. So from a political point of view, is it really a right move to stop this protest? Please come again. I'm asking from a political point of view, if it is a right move to stop this protest. Okay, thanks for the opportunity. And let me say good afternoon to your uh, viewers. Actually... Um, it's only a way to postpone the protest because uh, this came up naturally, spontaneously from the system. So to the extent that the causal element remains, the desire of the um, potential protesters to really go public will also stay. When it happens like this, the action of the police simply uh, deepen the desire you know, on the part of um, the protesters to go public. So in a way, it is being postponed. And I'd like to say that it doesn't inure, you know, to the benefit of the government at all. Um, you want to see the government in a democratic polity like ours facilitate such a move. So it was good that um, the National Security uh, Coordinator uh, met them to dialogue. If that didn't really go through, then he could have also worked with the police to find a way to facilitate, you know, the whole, uh, I mean, the protest. But to, 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 to you know, uh, use some sort of technicality, the way we, mm. we, we're looking at it now to stop it, you, 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 you only sort of uh, add to their desire to go public, and mm. then you also simply end up allowing the, 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 this thing, the number of people... Who, who are in this position to grow. So you, you eventually, you're going to have many citizens joining, you know, the movement. I don't think eventually mm. it, it will, you know, it will go away for uh, the government of the day. 
Doc, finally and briefly, so the, the, the government of the day has, has a challenge, which is to try and manage the, the COVID-19 situation we have, which uh, thankfully has been on the low for quite some time. And also, as you say, allow people to express their democratic rights. How, how do they go about balancing this, sir? That is where uh, dialogue was necessary. It, 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 it should, I think they could proceed with the numbers so that they could get these organizers to agree to limited, you know, uh, numbers and then uh, strict observance of, you know, the protocol in terms of uh, uh, distancing, the individuals distancing and, and, and allowing the police mm -hmm. to be with them. If, I mean, when, when you, you, you have a public protest, you don't necessarily need numbers to make the case you want to make. Eventually, you expect them to, you know, present a document to the government you know, um, making their positions formally, publicly known, you know, and, and, and of course, also making copies available to the media. So the rest of the country and the rest of the world would know about the issue that they, you know, are protesting against. Mm. It's possible to get some such thing, you know, uh, underway. It's possible if really they wanted to, you know, sort it out that way. Mm. I appreciate your time here this afternoon. Dr. Marcia Boating is a political science lecturer at the KNUSD, away from this subject matter. The number of lives lost to road traffic accidents remains high despite campaigns and interventions by government and private institutions. From January to April this year, 1,034 people have been killed on Ghana's roads. Some of the accidents were caused when moving vehicles run into stationary ones. As part of measures to enhance the fight against road crashes, the National Insurance Commission, NIC, and the insurance companies in the country will begin a pilot program to tow broken down vehicles in August this year. A proposal for all vehicle owners in the country to pay a mandatory towing levy was rejected by many Ghanaians. Head of the NIC, Dr. Justice Ofori, gave further details about this pilot project on Upfront. This idea has been floating around for some time. The Ghana Insurance Association had this in mind. They've worked on this for over two years. Uh, we have the Vice President of the country, His Excellency, also showing a lot of concern. We've had several meetings with him, and he has actually expressed uh, to find out what can we as insurers do to help. But there was a time that they, they wanted to propose a levy, which didn't actually uh, go well. So we've had engagement with our regulated entities, the uh, general business insurers, uh, who had already been working on this in the past. And we feel that we should be able to find a mechanism within the current um, uh, premium regime without raising any additional premium. Because we know that all comprehensive vehicles in our country have the towing elements in it. Mm. Uh, so uh, we have to find out how we can actually uh, take that towing element out and then um, use it as our, our give back to society. Um, it's not going to be an easy thing, but we think we, we have to want to pilot it in Accra. Hopefully by August, we, we hope that we, we might have been able to, to start. And then start the pilot program in Accra at no cost to the consumer. We all drive and we realize that stationary or disabled vehicles on our roads uh, are, are a danger to drivers and pedestrians. So whatever we can do to make our roads safe, we are going to start as an industry. Now, presidential advisor on health, Dr. Insia Sari, says the fact that there are only 52 orthopedic surgeons in the country, that is a, is a disaster. With rising accident cases and the need for complicated surgeries on victims, there are concerns the current number of trained surgeons is not enough to deal with critical cases. Speaking at the maiden annual general and scientific congress of the Orthopedic Association of Ghana, Dr. Nsiasari charged the College of Physicians and Surgeons to deeply innovate means to train more orthopedic surgeons. My colleague, Kukwa Sante, is at that program and has joined us via Zoom with more. So, uh, Kweku, what other issues have the surgeons been discussing at this annual meeting of years? Right. 
Hello, Kweku. Bennett, so a number of scary statistics intelligence at this conference where they've been given information about the number of uh, accidents that have been happening, particularly in the Ashanti region and other areas, and how scary some of those statistics are. Among other things, um, the information that they've been giving us include the fact that a lot of accidents, for instance, have been reported on Thursday evenings and on Friday evenings. There are still a lot of hospitals who don't have enough of the critical infrastructure needed to be able to take care of accident victims. They've also been explaining why people who do not have the necessary qualification and the experience to be able to deal with accident patients should wait and call the ambulance service to be able to take them. They say that over 80% or at least 80% of accident victims actually lose their lives before help comes to them. And so the, the, the stage through which an accident patient will get to the hospital and be taken care of and the kind of people who have access to the person, touch the person before they are transported to the accident has been causing a lot of issues. Mm. And so they are calling on government to be able to do more. And as you just uh, mentioned, the orthopedic surgeons issue has also been coming up heavily to be able to recruit more um, doctors who are specialized in this area to be able to treat patients. All right, quick, we'll leave it here. There'll be more on this particular Congress in subsequent bulletins. Now, pure grit and an unbroken resolve to prevail. That's the story of Sandama Senior High Technical School, who just won the first contest of the Upper East Regional Qualifiers of the 2021 National Science and Math Quiz. The three contestants from the school were the only ones wearing their bright yellow uniforms in the entire Bulga Nut Hall with more than 200 people. The reason is simple. The one-time quarter finalists have no bus in their school, and so they had to settle for a rickety five-seater Tata Mahindra pickup to bring them from Sandama all the way to Bolga. They've been speaking to my colleague Manuel Cranting after winning the contest. For the first time, getting there was some of the, some of the pressure. But when you get there, you are sat then, uh, you know, for the first question, the second question, the, second question uh, the pressure went down, so and I had him to sit there. Yeah. Answering the first two questions, the pressure went down and then you had the VIM too. But well, the question is difficult because Chris Mistress says that even though you qualified with 37 points, you could have done so much more. Yeah, because there are some of the questions that we had, the answers like in the spirit race, which we should have run to get more points, but due to, let's say, reduction of points and the fear in us, no confidence, we couldn't run for them. And there are a lot of some petty, petty mistakes that we've committed, which would have increased our points more than what we had. I see. T tell me, I, I look in order to and I saw just three of you together with your trainer making four. I mean, the lot of other schools that have brought as many as 20, as 30, as many as 30 students and all. Uh, you, you didn't feel, uh, you know, uh, intimidated at all? Yeah, we felt that intimidated with the fact that we wish if we could get our students here so that they can also back up and give support, but due to lack of our school bars, we don't have school bars, so we couldn't get many to bring. We just afforded all the three for, for the meantime. Okay, so how are you feeling? Was it for you? Uh, yes, really. Yeah. So it says like we've, we are the only three, and now if in case we get a, a, you know, a question why the clapping of the hands to give us the morale ahead, we are not getting it. But as we see other students, other schools bringing much more students, oh, it's really some feeling bad. So, but you eventually succumbed that and went over to win. How did you do that? Uh, it just, that's why Elia said, it's just a vim, you know. Uh, thinking that you can do it and you are going to win. So with that, you will, you will eventually become the winner. So. But, but say, how is it that you don't, you don't have, a, have enough of your students here to support your candidate? I wish we could have brought the whole school here to give us the support. But it's unfortunate our school doesn't have a bus. Uh, for about the past years, since 2012 that I joined that school, they have been having issues with uh, transport. It's only the pickup that is in... Uh, on the route and even at times it goes and leaves you on the way you have to get down to find your own means so because we don't have a bus that's why we only brought the three students and the teacher we wish we would have brought a lot of you students you think that if, if you had more students here they would have been more confident oh if we had more students we would have passed the 50 mark because the club would have gingered them to answer more uh, giving so now yeah, there's another qualifier tomorrow what, what should we expect from you uh, we, we committed some petty, petty errors. We hope to work on that and then come back strongly tomorrow to qualify for the national competition.
That's so touching, isn't it? We wish them all the best in the competition. Stay with us here for all the details on the ongoing regional NSMQ contests. Well, you're watching Draw News today with me, Ben. It's Abu Beidou Lansa. Coming up shortly, we've got business news for you. Do stay. <laughs> Good afternoon, time for business. My name is Daryl Kwao. The Asante in Otunfo said to the second has charged the mayor of Kumase and the Ministry for Railways Development to go ahead with its intended demolition of structures on the right of way in Kumase for the construction of the six kilometer Edum to Kase section of the Western Railway Line. The railway line will link the Ashanti region to the Western region. Let's hear from the Minister for Railways, John Peter Mel, who paid a Kesi call on the Asante Hene. There's currently a corridor running from Takradi through Dunkwa, Duni Valley, down to Kumasi over here, which we call the Western Corridor. That Western Corridor is noted for its industrial purposes. We are aware again of government agenda to develop an integrated industry with regard to the box line. We commence aggressive work on the Western Corridor. Currently, at the downside, we have a contractor by name Amandi working from Takradi down to Univali. At the upper section, we have the waters, uh, one of our own sons working at the northern end from uh, Kase down to Guade coming down. The gap between uh, Oguasi is also to be taken by a contractor which we call AFCOM from India. One of the major problems we're facing now is the line within the Kumasi metropolis. His Majesty, there will be a need to pave way for the right of way for somewhere. Let's turn to a Greek now. Ghana has exported maize to the United Kingdom as a pilot to Nestle Ghana's agripreneurship development program. According to the head of agricultural service, Fati Emis, Nestle collaborated with Sahel Grains and Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa to begin the agripreneurship development program to address challenges identified in the agri sector. It is based on this program that Ghana exported maize to the UK this year. Mr. Emis made the revelation at a webinar organized by AGRA. 36 youth of farmers coach and mentor to establish an outgrower. We also provided the input supply, like a seed, fertilizer, and mechanization services to the old youth who is part of our project. We also provided them with the precious technical know-how and hand-holding that give to the local farmer and SMEs to become world-class supplier. So, if you look at the high-level impacts of our intervention with those youth farmers in Ghana, the yield, average yield, not the specific individual farmers, overall our uh, participating youth entrepreneurs, the yield has increased 12%, while the income has increased 27%. Base quantity, which is very key for Nestle, is improved from 27% to 80% at the consignment level, which in our Nestle factory, when we are testing the grains with the highest quality standard, with the highest quality norms. Meanwhile, founding director of the West Africa Center for Crop Improvement at the University of Ghana, Professor Eric Dankwa, says the agri sector can only grow if it rides on innovation. I dare say that funding strategic public-private partnerships for the development of the Ghana seed production systems is a smart development investment, and we commend the Ghana Inclusive Agricultural Transformation Program for the opportunity to lead the early generation seed consortium. We have even better innovations in the pipeline and we ask for more support to show that we are a truly excellent institution. And as we say in Agra, let me seize this moment to appeal to the government of Ghana to do more for impact driven research, for we cannot transform our agriculture without innovation. We need to build resilient and robust food systems underpinned by self-reliance. In closing, um, Mr. Chair, let me reiterate that the promise I raised in the opening statement could be turned into reality 
if we would prioritize agriculture, we have to think beyond Malabo, cross the benchmarks to demonstrate that we truly envision a Ghana without aid. Thank you. And there's more business news coming up on the marketplace. Meantime, more news on our website, myjoyonline.com forward slash business up next sports. Time now for sports on Joy News today. I am Muftar Nabila Ablai. Juvenile League resumes this weekend and it is the first time in three years. And president of the Ghana Football Association, Kate Okreko, reckons each return will have an impact on the performances of the various national teams. There's more in the following report. Juvenile football has been on a hiatus since 2018 due to number 12 and the COVID-19 pandemic that broke last year. The competition makes a return this weekend and president of the Ghana Football Association, Ket Okriku, is convinced when the right structures are put in place at the grassroots level, it will have a rippling effect on the performance of national teams. Uh, it is only from the juvenile leagues that super talents can go through the ladder or can go up the ladder for, for, for national selectors to, to, to take notice. And if it is that the juvenile leagues are strong, our national teams invariably will be strong, especially the juvenile level. And if you, if you cast your mind back, in the years that Ghana has done very well at the juvenile level, our blasters have been very strong. Okay, so I'm extremely expectant, I'm extremely happy, and um, I, I think that we are in the right way. Uh, we are pressing the right buttons at the right time, in spite of the fact that we are in, a, we are in a, an extremely difficult period of COVID-19. I mean, it's, somebody will say it's no joke at all to operate within this period, but we are pushing, we are pushing and we, we, we're bringing along the industry step by step. The GFA had planned to organize the Juvenile League last year, but during the registration process, an accident in Ofinso led to the demise of some young players, forcing the football governing body to postpone the competition indefinitely. Mr. Okreku says his outfit is doing everything they can to ensure the football season is a success. We're pressing every, every button. Um, i.e. by way of regulations, i.e. by way of logistics, uh, i.e. by way of infrastructure. Um, so you, you heard me say that games are going to take place at what we call the game centers. Games are going to take place behind closed doors in the five regions that I've mentioned. Games are going to take place in very secured facilities across the country. As much as we can, as much as humanly possible, we, we want to ensure that the, the, the footages, the pictures from our games are, are clean and, and, and of quality. And that's the only way we can attract individuals and corporate Ghana to pay attention to us. As the Juvenile League will be starting this weekend, the Ghana Premier League, that one is on March the 23rd. This weekend, Kumasi Asante Kotoko will square off with Dreams FC. And the first game happens this afternoon where West African Football Academy will be playing Great Olympics. Tomorrow is Asante Kotoko at the Obuasi Lenclay Stadium against Dreams FC. On Sunday, an avalanche of matches as Ashanti Gold comes up against the Chiman 11 Wonders. A Busua drops will also face Legon Cities. A car house of Oku play Kim Faisal. Liberty Professional will also host league leaders Mediama SC. Adriana Stars versus Brecum Chelsea and Carla United will also be facing Bechimi United. That's all time will permit us for sports on Joy News today. I am Muftar Nabila Abla. There's more sports on my joyonline.com slash sports. Meanwhile, the rapper has added her voice to the hashtag Fix the Country campaign. Uh, she said it, if the country needed fixing, the responsible quarters must, be, uh, must make sure they put in the work. I don't know. Personally. Well, uh, I think I think I have not thinking right now. <laughs> You're a citizen. Yeah, I, I know. Mean. I think... Um, um, oh, this is not politics. Every every country needs to be fixed. That is why we vote for leaders. And okay. so definitely, I think if Ghana is fixed and fixed properly, it will be cool. Yeah.
Now, High Life Sensation Kim Promise has expressed his gratitude to, for the support of fans and Ghanaians after inking a massive deal with 5K Records and Sony Music UK. He promised to live up to expectations by selling the Ghanaian sound globally. Kim Promise in the building. Um, big shout out to everybody who's been supporting me. I'm super thankful. I'm excited about this new deal. The goal has always been global domination and taking the music across the borders of Ghana, all the way, all around the world. Um, we've seen the likes of all the Africans do it, like, you know, Whiskey, Mr. Easy, etc. And um, it's about time that I do my thing and take it all the way to the top as well. So, um, shout out to my team, Legacy Life Entertainment, shout out to the new family, 5K Records, Sony Music UK. We're about to do this. On that note, we end showbiz here on Joy News today. My name is Becky. Bold News is up next.